Hi, thanks for joining. I'm Chris Gennaro, your host. Uh, my co-host is Eric Risk, and today we have Orak. How are you doing, guys? Good. Good. Thanks for having us. How are you? Uh, so we're just going to start out how we always start out, just saying who you are and what you do in the band. Sure. Yeah. Um, I'm Sebastian. I do vocals and guitar. I'm Phil. I do uh, backing vocals and rhythm guitar. Okay. Uh, so you guys got a new EP out, uh, Stolen Angelic Tongues. Uh, it's been a, a, about four years since uh, you guys did a, a recording. Uh, it seems like you guys been doing a lot of touring and stuff. I guess just bring us into like what, uh, how the new EP came about and what you guys have been doing for the last four years. Yeah, I, I know that that number might sound kind of long, but it's, it's kind of a certain truth because the LP of Mute Books didn't, didn't come out until spring of 2017. And I think Mute Books didn't actually come out till the end of 2016. And, and we were done this album and, or EP in, in 2019. So it's really not that much time. I, it was like a personal pet peeve when I saw a lot of people online being like, oh, first record in four years. It's like, kind of, kind of not. It, we wrote it pretty quickly after Mute Books. Um, but yeah, we've been touring a lot. We, uh, we did two trips in Europe. One was the, the first tour with, with Phil, that was last year. And that was uh, Phil's first time abroad with us. And that was a good tour. And, uh, and before that, we did a tour supporting Pro Fanatica, which was really cool. And of course, a little bit bigger. And, and, and that was a cool experience, too. Yeah, I saw you guys do have done a lot of like festivals and stuff lately. I, it looks like there was a lot of, uh, I think, Immolation you were playing with. Um, and uh, so how did you get hooked up with a lot of those festivals and stuff? Do you do, you do your tour around those those dates? Yeah, I, no, no two situations kind of end up working out the same with this thing. But um, uh, some of the festivals were when we did the tour with Pro Fanatica, of course, for that one, because it was a bit bigger, there was a booker. So he secured some bigger ones. Um, then when we did the other one last year, there was um, one fest. And then we managed to get ourselves onto another fest because they heard we would already be there for the first fest. So sometimes it's a bit word of mouthy to secure those. And then the immolation one, we were actually the promoters of it. So it was pretty easy to sneak our band onto the bill. Well, there you go. Yeah, if you're gonna set up your own gigs, then uh, you, got, you got the right spot. Uh, so you mentioned that Phil was, uh, it, it, this was his first tour with you guys. It sounded like you were on guitar and then maybe you, you stopped playing guitar and just focused on the vocals. Me? Yeah. No, I, I still play guitar. We, we oh, both okay. play guitar. Yeah, actually, you know who you're thinking of? Colin. Oh, Sam. shit. Yeah, oh, maybe yes. that's... Yeah, he was, he was on guitar earlier in the band, and now he's only on vocals. That's a very good, ob obscure point. Good job on your homework on that one. Um, uh, <laughs> we, can, we can get to that a little later if you want, for sure. Okay, sure. It's a lot longer story, just because I know you're asking about Phil, and that's probably a distractor from it. Sure. Well, yeah. Well, I guess let's talk about how you guys how you hooked up with Phil and Phil. What you know, uh, how you guys got together. I guess it's just simply a case of everybody's making the same music, sort of in the same jam space. Everybody kind of knows each other. There came a need for a second guitarist within the band. I think it just created a fuller sound, ability to play more of what was on the recordings, as opposed to just being limited in a live capacity and we just it, the chemistry was good and it just seemed like a good fit after a while so yeah. i assume you were maybe in some uh, uh, uh another area band or something that was that you guys knew each other through yeah yeah i mean it's it's a big circle of bands i mean there's it's the covenant music collective we put on covenant festival in vancouver a lot of the people who are involved in that sort of have their own little projects and everything. And it's, it's like any other scene. It's fairly incestuous being the same 10 people making the same 50 bands. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, the truth. Yeah, we've definitely heard a lot of that. Uh, so let's talk a little bit more about Stolen Angelic Tongues. Um, it definitely seems like a theme album. Um, I, I did read a couple of interviews that you guys had done, uh, you know, talking about um, 
some of the mysticism maybe, uh, and it seems like there's definitely a story there behind that. Yeah, um, a theme, theme album is fair. N you know, normally when we write our music, we write it about uh, personal spirituality, personal views, experiences, nothing. I mean, the, the subject matter may, may be unique, but to write about that is obviously not unique. So we wanted to depart from that um, just to do something completely different because anything, no matter how close it is to your heart, can be tedious to write about for the you know fourth or fifth consecutive record so it's on theme in that it's still an album um concerning occultism and philosophy but we wanted to to look at a different area of the world and for once kind of more just be an interested observer in writing it um so with all that said it centers around the haitian revolution uh, in the 1700s which i think is a very interesting religious event in the sense that you have this amalgamation of all these African practices that are being infused with the Catholicism of the enslavers and also with a mishmash of Western occultism from France and all these people traveling through the Caribbean. It ends up creating the faith that we now know as Haitian voodoo. So I wanted to approach the Haitian revolution from a spiritual perspective rather than a strictly historical academic perspective. And I think that made for a fun experiment. Cool. And then uh, talk about, I guess, the, the album cover. You guys got a Brazilian artist to do it, although it looks very, very Eastern, you know, uh, to me at least. Yeah, fair enough. Um, her name is Lupe Vasconcelos, and she's from Brazil. Uh, so obviously to add a bit of authenticity to the, to the record, we thought that the cover would kind of be illegitimate if it wasn't done by someone who's either Caribbean or South, South American. So she's Brazilian, and in there's a Brazilian faith, a Brazilian occultism known as Kimbanda. And in Kimbanda, there's a, a powerful female spirit, which is one of the main spirits of the current called Pombajira. And that was her interpretation of Pombajira. So I, I'm not sure what influences she's drawing from to create her Pombajira. Maybe there is something Eastern in there, but we, we sort of told her what we wanted on the cover and gave her free reign to do it. Okay, it's, I was looking through her stuff. I, I mean, I, she's probably not like a metal person, right? But it's funny, she's got definitely a lot of stuff when I look through it and I'm like, oh shit, that could be a death metal cover. Like, the, like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like it's a lot of, I, not traditional death metal stuff, but there's definitely a lot of skulls and, and, and very cool, weird, um, I don't want to say demonic, but there's, there's some definitely cool stuff in there and I can definitely see why you were drawn to her her artwork yeah she's a she's a spectacular artist and as you pointed out I don't think she's a metalhead either in no point in our discussions did we actually talk about music um I threw her a couple reference points of of images we liked and colors we liked and what we were envisioning but uh I don't think she's a metalhead okay yeah she, but however, she takes, I know that she takes her spiritual practice very seriously and draws from an eclectic bunch of things. Cool. And, uh, you know, in looking through some of your stuff, uh, you know, I know that you guys used to be called Tusk and you, uh, you changed. I think it was sort of interesting to me because I went and looked you guys up on, on uh, Metal Archives and it said that you used to be a thrash band. And, you know, listening to all your stuff, I was like, I, I, I kind of wanted to hear that. I was looking for it because I can't, I was having a hard time trying to envision you guys mm -hmm. doing a thrash record when your stuff is just not at all like that, you know, but I, I understand obviously that you guys grow, you know, there's a long time period for you, for you guys to change your music. Yeah. I mean, uh, the, the the connection still haunts us with, with this with this question so we we started the band when we were quite young um tusk i think we started when we were 15 or 16 and so you know we like death metal and thrash metal and also you you're less picky about exactly what it sounds like when you're that age right you just want to make music to make music uh you don't have so much prejudice about what the the label on it might be However, as we got older, then you reach peak prejudice age, right? When you're 19, 20, 21, and you really care exactly what it is. So when we were about 
2021, we sort of overhauled the whole, the whole thing. It's not like the band completely changed. It's the same lyrical philosophy, the same style of writing, I suppose, in some ways. And uh, some songs were brought up to speed and, and changed to a new form. But, but that was a long time ago when we were a thrash metal band, for sure. Um, so uh, let's see, what else can we talk about? Um, so I, you guys got, uh, you still, I would think that the coronavirus would have taken out most of the shows, but it looks like you've got some upcoming gigs with Niall, perhaps? At the COVID end permitting. Of next year. At oh, the sorry, end of Phil, go ahead. Oh, when, nothing. That I just said COVID permitting, of course. So when, when is that? When are those, those? I'm sorry. So those are gigs that are coming up? That's October next year, isn't it? Phil? Oh, shit. That's, so that's like... It's a long time. That's a long time out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and like Phil it's said, like a, almost COVID a year COVID away. Almost a year. Away. Yeah, yeah. It's crazy how far that stuff gets booked out. I, you know, I'm definitely, I must not be paying attention to the dates then. I'm just like, oh, shit, they're playing with Nile. That's cool. Who's got the time to be paying attention to things these days? <laughs> yeah, I was like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not seeing that that show anytime soon. I've, uh, I've, you know, I've got tickets. I've got tickets for a show in April that I'm quite not sure is going to happen. So, um, and uh, oh, you played uh, Vitus. They, Eric, they played Saint Vitus in 2016. Okay. So yeah, was I... that that was one of your your tours? That's that's a. a a club that's local to us and and uh we've gone to a bunch of times you guys are in new york yeah um eric's in new york i'm in new jersey oh right on yeah we played vitus in 2016 and obviously we've all um you know me phil sean and zach have all watched and worshipped videos of our favorite bands playing at vitus so many times over the years and seeing that uh you know that skull with the blindfold in the background so so even though it's not the biggest venue in the world by any means, playing there was pretty surreal because, uh, you know, we, in the glory days of music, there were clubs that were famous. And, and I don't know, I think that's something that's kind of missing these days. Clubs that themselves have a cult following. It doesn't matter what's going on there. You know it's going to be good. So maybe it's just us being Canadian and not living in the United States. But Vitus kind of had this mythical presence around it in our heads. So, so to play there was pretty cool. And it was a sold out show. And the local support was Artificial Brain, so that's not too crappy. Oh, awesome. Yeah, and uh, that was yeah, a really awesome. cool show. Yeah. Yeah, actually, I, I play in a band with uh, Sam. In a oh, sweet. Yes, yeah, Sam was a, an awesome guy, definitely. Yeah, he's a cool, cool, cool guy. Yeah. Okay, cool. Shit, I just had my next question, and then I, I promptly forgot it as we're, as we're talking about Artificial Brain. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, so you guys, so Stolen Angelic Tongues is on, uh, 20 buck, uh, 20 buck spin. Your, your previous couple things were on Profound Lore, uh, the, the Mute Books and, and I, uh, and I think the, uh, God, I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna butcher all these names, but Tom and Chud. Nice, you did it. Okay, thanks. Um, so you guys were on Profound Lore. What, how did you get hooked up with 20 buck spin? Uh, it, it's not, not a very exciting story. Like Dave is a great guy and, and a big supporter of ours when we were still trying to, but, but I think before Tam and Shud came out and he had stocked the records in his store and it was something like he had this deal where if you buy the Gorguts discography, then you get Tam and Shud. He was like promoting the record for no good reason, like just out of the goodness of his heart. If you buy the Gorguts discography, you get Tam and Shud at half price or something like that. And uh, I had seen that and I thought it was really cool. And then we started chatting and he offered to reissue From Forgotten Worlds on vinyl. Oh, okay. and, uh, and From Forgotten Worlds had come out on a Polish label called Health Rasher and it only came out on CD. So, so it was great. And of course we wanted it to come out on vinyl. And that was around the time where Phil joined the band too, we were random aside. Um, and uh, and part of the deal for him to reissue it on vinyl was he wanted us to do an EP for him. And so that was, was of course, no issue. And so we agreed to do an EP for him. Cool. How did you wind up on a Polish label to begin with? Uh, you know, back when uh, uh, you were doing uh, Forgotten Worlds. I, uh, I think when you're, you're starting out, unless you happen to get a 
uh, you know, pull a rabbit out of the hat, amazing offer. You, you have to take the first solid offer that comes your way. Right. So they're, they're a good label. I still check into what they're putting out and distroing. Um, not the biggest label in the world. And of course they didn't have the budget to do the LP, but they were, they were going to do a good job with it. And the, the distribution was good and that's all that mattered. They heard it and liked it and wanted to do it. So we were talking a little bit about before the interview and, and you mentioned uh, that you work at a boxing club. I, I wanted to squeeze that in there before I forgot. Uh, I, so do you, is that something you do between touring and stuff? Yeah, that's my full-time job is I teach boxing. Cool. And, and it sounds like that's the type of gig then that you could like take off and do, you know, a couple month tour if you need to. It, it's certainly nice to have the flexibility. Yep. It, it, it does work that way. Cool. Do you, uh, and who else, who else have you guys been uh, touring with? You mentioned a couple bands. Uh, any, uh, any other good shows or like crazy stories that you have that you want to talk about? <laughs> uh phil and anything good that you can think of from when we went to to europe i mean apart from just fine dining sunny skies and just crazy good bands playing all in the same pack room <laughs> a little surreal um barring that just all in all very good experience yeah um it, it's weird all these things seem so distant because it's it's been over a year since we last played a show right yeah. Um, it, it's, it seems so long ago. I don't know. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad it seems recent when you read about it and research it on the internet. But in my yeah. head, I'm like, oh, God, <laughs> I remember when I used to play music, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Are, are you guys still jamming, uh, you know, in with the pandemic and, and uh, rehearsing and, and that stuff? Or, or is, is that put a hold on that stuff, too? We were when, when the, uh, the numbers were at such a level that it allowed it. But right now, Vancouver is in, I don't know, is this, is this full lockdown, Phil, or does it go another level beyond this? They're drifting in between asking us nicely to lock ourselves down and vaguely threatening us with fines. I'm not really sure. I'm just treating it like full lockdown. Yeah, it, it, that's true. It's actually been quite not, not very specific here. I think even the people who, who want to play ball, it's difficult to play ball when the, uh, the orders are unclear. But yes. We were jamming, and we uh, we actually managed to record quite a lot of stuff with our side projects and stuff this year. Um, Phil and I have another band called Garroting Deep, and, and we recorded the full length for that earlier, which is great because we did it just in time before lockdown hit, and now nobody's jamming. Okay. And and speaking about side projects and stuff, I was going to ask about your, your relationship with Mitochondrian and how that works sharing like a bunch of members but then also like getting to do the splits together you know you guys did a split seven inch together um so how does like you want to talk about that and how that all works out sure um yeah so m myself and and sean who's not here we both play in mitochondrion sean plays bass and does vocals in Orock, and i play guitar and vocals in Orock, and then we do the reverse in mitochondrion where sean does guitar and vocals and i do bass and vocals um, as far as collaborative stuff, in 2014, we did a tour in Europe with Mitochondrion and Oroch. That was exhausting to play, you know, two sets every yeah, single night. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and also um, Ritual Necromancy was on that tour. I don't know if you guys know them, but they're a tremendous band. So it was a very cool tour, a uh, really powerful experience, but very draining to play, to play two sets every night. However, we didn't learn our lesson because then in 2016, we did the exact same thing again. And, uh, and we toured the United States. That's when we did the Vitus show um, with, uh, with Phobocosm from Montreal. It took me a second to remember. And, uh, but after, after that, we said, we absolutely can't do this again. So we've done some fests since. Like last year, we went to Iceland with both bands. Um, and uh, and both bands played, but we played on separate days. So it's, it's draining to do that, but it's quite a glorious feeling when you when we do get to pull it off. It's just quite tiring. And then um, and then the split was just an inevitability. If the two bands are so closely linked, we we felt like we had to kind of do the split with these conjoined lyrics and shared riffs in the songs and so on. Yeah, I was gonna say maybe it would be maybe the next time you're thinking about it, it would be not a bad idea to just not play on the same night. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Except on a tour, that's impossible, of course. Right. 
Well, can't you do like a, what, a Saturday and then a Sunday or something like that? It's a know? tour. Both bands are on the tour. It's not well, possible. okay. A t- yes, for a tour. Okay. okay. <laughs> the, the, the honest answer to that, while it's kind of boring and kills the fun of the fantasy, is the, the logistics, right? You can, the more people you put in the car, the more money, the, the more gas you have to put in the car, the more gas you have to put in the car, the more money. And then all of a sudden you're driving it just for every person to play every other night. So right, yeah. all, that, all that stuff always affects on whether or not a tour gets picked up. Like we work with Killtown bookings when we go to Europe. And, and that's the kind of stuff he always gives us a hard time about, about organizing the tour, like number of people in the car. Does this package make sense? Oh, that package could make sense, but both bands are four, four person bands. Can we get it to a three person? You know, so all that stuff matters when you're organizing mileage on the road. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, so I know that kills the fun of the, the suggestion, but that's the honest answer. So where, where else have you guys toured besides Europe? And it's obviously Canada, U.S. Have you done anything else outside there? Uh, yeah, we did. We did Iceland last. I, I suppose that doesn't technically count as mainland Europe. When when was that? June, July, Phil? That would have been June 2019, right around summer solstice, I think. Yeah, so we, that was a great festival. I just um, remember sitting in the chair and going, oh, yeah, when's the last band? Holy shit, it's midnight. It's already over. Why is the sun yeah, still it, out? Yeah, it's it's such a bizarre thing that all day sunlight. <laughs> oh wow! Okay, that is crazy. Yeah. So crazy. We, we played in Iceland and that was really cool. We've we've done uh, two trips to Mexico. Oh, awesome! Uh, played Mexico City twice. Wow. The first time we did a mini tour with. Um, do you guys know Hakavits? Like awesome, legendary Mexican old school death metal band. No, not familiar. Not familiar, with. but I was going to say we do definitely when we post the videos. We put all the links of everything like we talk about and stuff, like Sweet. all the other bands. Just because I, I, I don't know. I personally feel like cross promotion and stuff in the scene is really important. So, you know, it allows, at least in my, my uh, fantasy, it allows people to go and just follow along and just check out the stuff as, as they're going without. Yeah, too much that, that's a nice touch. I've never seen someone do that before. Good idea, man. Okay, well, then, then let's make it direct. You have to listen to Hakavits or kill yourself. <laughs> there we go now it's a direct order um so the main guy in Hakavits is um and timo buonano who was who was the front man of disgorge the old school mexican death oh, metal band yeah. i know that um, yeah. yeah everyone knows that ranch everyone about knows sarcoma that. music video right everyone's seen it a thousand times whether or not you know you've seen it it's like chris if you think you haven't seen it you've actually seen it <laughs> you do youtube it later and you'll be like oh yeah i have seen this um and so we got to do two, two shows there with Hakavits and then, uh, and then we did what was supposed to be Phil's first show with us in, in uh, Mexico City again for Total Death Over Mexico. Yeah, yeah I, I know I got very excited. I think Brujeria was on uh, Ozark um, <laughs> last season. And I, I oh. they, were, they were like torturing What's-His-Name by, by playing Brujeria for him. And I was like, it's fucking awesome. You know, you get all... <laughs> So we played with we played with Brujeria once in um oh shit in in California yeah okay yeah. I love that you much. know what yes. because it's it's so new metally I I it's not my personal thing I can't get into it though I like the uh, I like the Zapatista message but when they played it was it was the end of 2016 right before the first Trump election. And they got a huge chant of fuck Donald Trump going. So I was like, okay, okay, they get a pass. Like I wasn't into it before, but then I'm like, ah, this was pretty sick. And then they went crazy. So it was, it was cool. So I get, yeah. So let's talk about your influences then. Um, you know, there, there's, there's like a lot of speed, a lot of grinding in your stuff, but then, you know, there's a lot of melodic shit too. I, I was listening uh, like, to some of your stuff and i'm like oh shit you know if these guys really wanted to do a horror soundtrack they could like easily put something really super cool together just by like the non-metal stuff too you know thank you um yeah man it's all it's all over the map like i think all we all listen to a a, a lot of sh- shared things that we all enjoy um but we each have our own tastes that we I don't know, try to force on the other. I like to think we let that bleed through enough. Um, 
it's always a struggle. The second you get experimental, and feel, feel, feel free to disagree with me here, but the second you, you get a little experimental, there's always that urge to rein it back in and write something classic and death metal. And then when you do that for too long, you feel bored with it, like you're repeating yourself. So we try to let the non-metal stuff seep in and, and actually a lot of horror soundtracks, like we were really into when we were writing mute books, we listened to the um, 28 Days Later soundtrack again. The composer's name is escaping me right now, but there's that, uh, there's that one song on that soundtrack called In, in the House in a Heartbeat. And uh, we, I don't want to say we ripped that off, but we, we let that influence the record pretty thoroughly in a bunch of different songs. We, we kept coming back to, like it, we would have done it already. And then in another song we'd be writing and, and Zach, who's really the guy who's really into soundtracks in the band, he's the drummer. Zach would be like, hey, that in the house in the heartbeat thing. I know we've used it five times, but we could kind of reinvent it here. Um, so, and of course, Fred Meyer's Phantasm, um, Exorcist, Tubular Bells. Uh, the horror soundtracks are a big influence. Um, Phil's got his own own tastes, of course, but that's just my two cents. Phil, what, what's your non-metal stuff that you think influences Orok? I mean, I can't really speak for Orok myself, having not really contributed too, too much to it. But I guess to add to your point and your thesis, it's just, I mean, at the end of the day, innovative music requires innovation, right? I mean, when Morbid Angel and Possessed were writing their music, it's not like they had Morbid Angel and Possessed to reference. So in the end, kind of that spirit of death metal does require you to push forward into the unknown. So I find, a, I mean, I guess just speaking to my own personal taste, but I guess in my opinion, sort of a limiting factor in some creative processes within this genre is a lot of people are kind of self-referential as far as the genre they're trying to create. Whereas the spirit that really, really captivated them when they first heard it in the first place was they were listening to something that was completely new in the first place. So if you want to create something with that spirit, you do have to just kind of go into the unknown until you make something of yourself. Yeah, I know. It's kind of interesting because when, when I tell people like all the different stuff I listen to and the non-metal stuff, uh, there's definitely still like a, a theme and a vibe there, you know, because, you know, mm -hmm. you, you would never call like Dead Can Dance, who I love, metal, but yet they've got that sort of really dark, super dark vibe. And I've seen them a bunch. And it's weird to go to see a band that does like all this gothic stuff and there's all like black kids in black metal t-shirts there you know and you're like oh so i'm not the only one you know who sort of sees that connection or feels that connection well i mean to comment yeah. on dead can dance i'm a huge fan myself as well it's just black metal and dead can dance both share that sort of dark romanticism to it right so yeah i mean the connection is fairly obvious if you know what you're looking for but i mean i guess at first glance you definitely can see the people walking around in I don't know, you can see the world music type people who are into, say, Within the Realm of a Dying Sun versus, say, the original goth rockers into their self-titled album. They're going to be looking at each other strangely, let alone people that look like us walking around in black metal shirts at the show. Cool. What, uh, what, what, what are you looking forward to doing in the future with, with Orok? You know, I we've never... Uh, we've never taking a break so actually uh taking a break zach and i were just texting about it yesterday we, this whole time we've been saying oh i can't get back wait to get back to it i can't wait to get back to it and yesterday we kind of realized uh, taking a break is actually really good because uh we have no plans of quitting no plans of stopping and it's nice to just have several months where there's no expectation to do anything i think it will be refreshing for whatever the next chapter is phil sorry you were going to say something and i cut you off Oh, literally, I was about to say taking a break. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it's been interesting. You know, our opening question was about the first new music in four years. And it's, uh, since we were 20 years old, I'm 30 now. So si since we were 20 years old, last decade, it's been do a tour, put out an album, do a tour, put out an album, do a tour, put out an album. And the returns have made it worth it. And of course, you know, when it's your dream, you, you want to do that and you want to constantly push for bigger shows and you want to sign to your favorite labels and it's exciting when you do. But at a certain point, I think if you don't take a year just to, hey, let's not do the band this year, which is a difficult thing to say. And we never would have said it unless it was a pandemic. 
-hmm. But to just be like, hey, let's not do the band in 2020 has, has got me quite excited to do the band after this. So, so yeah, Phil and I are on the same page. Cool. There's no plan until that Nile show. The Nile show is the next thing. Cool. What, what is it? The, the separation makes the heart grow fonder or something like that? There's some type yes, of... Yes. There it is. Yes, yeah, yes, lots yes. of cliches. If it was ever <laughs> yours, let it go and it will come back to you. Yada, yada, yada. Um, just looking over my notes and stuff. Uh, I think erecting the X Monday, Axis Monday... Uh, there was, was there a sitar on there or something like that? I was hearing some weird instruments that did not quite sound like a guitar on there. The the opening track? No, I think I think that's the last. Isn't that the last oh, track of the, the the closing one? The closing, so the closing one. Yeah. The closing one is an interesting song. Um, the base of it is, and this actually will segue into something you asked about earlier. So the base of it is a layer of two voices. It's the voice of our friend who goes by Scythe Bearer, and we've had him on a bunch of the recordings. He's on Mute Books. Uh, he's on the Mitochondria on Rock Split. Phil and him have worked together for some live um, noise performances. And so he does uh, Tibetan-style throat singing. So the bass is him doing that low oh, gurgle, and... Um, our friend Kulin, who goes by Kulain in all of his uh, music, and it's him doing, he's just a, there's no describing his vocal style until you see it in person. He can do just about anything you'd ask for. He can do R&B, he can do King Diamond. Uh, so it's him doing just this low noise. I can't think of anywhere, any other way to describe it. He just started letting this frequency out of his mouth, and it was the lowest, most reverberating thing. And then he goes, yeah, that was awesome. Don't put any reverb on that just so I can show off how low it already was. So it's a clip of him with specifically no reverb on it. And then a clip of our friend throat singing just combined. If it sounds like an instrument, it's just a testament to how infernal the noise was. That's cool. I, yeah, I'm kind of looking forward to like incorporating more of that type of shit into your stuff because... I don't know. I, I find it really interesting. And, and when you're listening to a ton of metal, when you hear different stuff like that, it, it's definitely cool. Um, right. Definitely into it. Uh, oh, and I was, you know, I tried to watch that Spanish interview you, you had. Uh, I was like, maybe I'll pick up something. You guys did a Spanish. It was, was, it was something you were promoting on your, your Facebook page. Yeah. Um, who was that or how did that come about and go ahead sorry no because I, I obviously i could i don't speak spanish so i couldn't follow any of it but uh but i couldn't figure out who it was and do do want do one of you guys speak spanish yeah that was me i just had hair in the, in the interview okay which is why yeah. i couldn't recognize <laughs> it. Uh, yeah uh I speak Spanish. Phil also speaks Spanish. Uh, I, I'm Chilean. Phil just happens to speak Spanish. But yeah, I, I'm Chilean. So that's, uh, that's our friend who has been mentor, um, promoter, manager. He, he does concerts in town and he's just been very helpful to us over the years. And he's Mexican. And he um, uh, works with a magazine in Mexico to, to promote even though he he lives here and he puts on shows here. So that Nile show, he was, he was the, the lead promoter of it. And then Phil mentioned Co the Covenant Festival that we all work on as a team. And Phil mentioned the collective circle we have. Mayo is, um, he's only artistically part of it in a small capacity, quite recent. We have a new project where he does vocals, but he's been probably the person who is most at the heart of it, who, who has never contributed artistically. If it, if it weren't for him, there wouldn't be a lot of the, mitochondria on or covenant festival shows he's a big time uh silent partner if you will okay cool yeah send me send me uh that information uh, you know i'll put uh, his stuff in the links too obviously sure. um, and, and he's got a, a sick new band and that will be out soon well speaking about uh, is there any other bands and and friends bands and and uh guys you were touring with that you, that you want to promote and and Give us some new music to check out. Anything that we sure. haven't already talked about? I mean, Phil, should we just do the list of all the other stuff in the Covenant Jam Room? 
It's probably is, the most is, expedient way is to screw it. Arrogant? Is 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 that okay? We've got so many other projects on the go. I think it would be interesting. Yeah, do it. Up. Do it. Yeah. Okay. Phil, you start. All right. Uh, as for projects Seb and myself are involved in, I'm involved in Auroc, obviously. Seb and I are working on this full length, as Seb mentioned earlier, called Garroting Deep. It's more of a, uh, I guess, avant-garde death metal. I work with a couple of friends on this project that's kind of similar to almost like Migwa Drew Cape Forest called Akiros Expanse. We'll be recording that fairly soon. Seb, I'll let you list off everything you're involved with because it's a bit of a mouthful. <laughs> we have the new Mitochondrion album, which, believe it or not, is finally getting finished. Um, uh, we have another product, project that me, Sean, everyone in Oroch except for Zach, that's the easier way of saying it, is in, uh, plus a scythe bearer, and that's called Apex Predator. Uh, we have another new project coming called Egregore, and that's a crazy progressive thrashy death metal that me, Phil, and Sean did. Um, I don't know. It, it goes on and on and on, but I can send you links to all of those. And it, on the Covenant Bandcamp, it, uh, it's a good testament to just how busy our jam room is. So what, what is the Covenant Bandcamp, though? Like, um, like, tell us a little bit more about that. Well, just we, we try to put everything under this Covenant name. If it's the Covenant Collective and we do the Covenant Festival. And if you go to covenantmagazine.com, you can see all the things we're talking about, all the articles that we publish and all the, the, the bands are a feature there. We, we just put a band camp together to have all of our bands all on one page. So there's about 50 or 60 records on there that, uh, like Phil said, the 10 people in our jam room have recorded in some configuration or another. So you did, so you, you all share a physical space that, you know, people are coming in and out and stuff, I assume. Yeah. When, when there's not a pandemic, but yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, obviously, but you're still paying the rent on the place, right? I mean, we're still paying the rent. Yes. That's the storage true. space. Why, why did you have to bring it up? This interview was going so well, and then you brought that up. Uh, I know. Sometimes, like, they, like, we have a band room, too. They gave us a little bit of a break in the beginning, and then it went back to the regular price. They give you, like, a little bit of the price reduction, and then it went, you know. What is your band called? Oh, uh, Everturn. How is Everturn. it spelled? Uh, A-E-V-I-T-E-R-N-E. -E -E. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. They play with uh, Sam. And uh, uh, Garrett from, I mean, I was in another band, uh, Flourishing, if you've heard of that. I was in Yeah, I, I have. I have. I played bass yeah. in Flourishing. Oh, that, oh, that's awesome, man. Yeah, that's a really cool project. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. But, but yeah, but I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, you yeah, know, looking forward to, you know, hopefully everything eventually yeah, gets back to normal, start playing again and jamming and stuff, you know. Exactly. We're all, we're, we're, every, every musician you talk to will have the identical answer for that. You're one. right. You're right. I'm not alone. <laughs> <laughs> no, I feel you. I, I get yeah. it. Yeah. But, uh, oh, oh, wait, we can go back to then. So then uh, Cullen, uh, he is only on vocals. He was on guitar in the very yeah. beginning. So, so that's, um, I, I think that's an interesting one. It's not something we've touched on a ton, though a couple recent interviews we've done have, like you guys, kind of picked up on it and figured it out. Because when we, when we announced he will be doing it, we didn't make a huge deal of it. There was a, a couple posts on social media with a, I thought it was a fabulous photograph of him wearing an Uzbek robe with a giant beard and a cat on his shoulder, but that's neither here nor there. So we made a small announcement that... Um, that Coolin will be returning to do the vocals and anyone who's a diehard fan of the band cared and anyone who just happened to be following the band probably went in one ear and out the other. So we didn't push it too much and we just left it there in the credits with uh, the updated band photo, pardon me, of the five of us instead of the four. But recently a couple interviews have picked up on it. So Coolin founded the band in 2006 as Tusk with myself and uh, the drummer at the time whose name was Solomon. And then when we became Oroch, it was basically just me and Kulin. One of the other guys quit, one of the other guys moved away, and one of the other guys, we kicked him out. So it was just Kulin and I. And then um, we linked up with Zach, who we had known from 
childhood and we knew he played the drums, but we hadn't spoken to him in 15 years. Or, no, that's impossible. 10 years. I had to do some math there. Um, and then, of course, you know, being young men, eventually you have a, a schism over something. It involved a, women, a woman and it involved drugs. And it was nothing that hasn't happened a million times before. And we stopped talking for a time. And then as adults, we became friends again. And uh, we thought it would be a, a nice gesture in our own narratives to kind of close the circle and um, have Coolin come back into the band. And he's, like I said earlier, he's a tremendous vocalist, uh, capable of anything, really. And um, it was nice on a personal level to have him come and, uh, and handle the vocals and put his touch on it. So that was the point of that. Okay. So that's... That makes sense. I mean, he was the, yeah, one of the original members. And now exactly. Yeah. yeah. Cool. And, then, and then on top of it, he's an extremely close friend of Phil and Sean and I and Zach. So. Okay. Yeah, I feel like it, it's, you know, it, it's just a story, you know, a story arc. I, I, yeah. We've heard, we've heard lots of stories like this before, you know, and, and I, I do think that, that it, it does make for things to be interesting to, to – like you said, close those loops and stuff. It brought a real passion to the thing, right? It, it, it's casual. It's it's exoteric. It's not remotely esoteric. It's not a cool story at all. But it, but it brought a, a very kind of bare passion that was, uh, at least I thought it was palpable. Cool. I'm um, I'm sort of getting toward towards the end of my notes, Eric. Do you got Do you got anything else? Uh, um, I think that pretty much. Uh, well, I, I may just one just general question. So, yeah, the scene is, uh, you said, very incestuous. What is the scene like, though, just overall, the metal scene in Vancouver? Like, I know one, I mean, I have a friend that lives in Vancouver. I've been there once, way back 2007. I love the city. I think it's beautiful. It's a beautiful city. Uh, like, uh, but, yeah, what is the metal scene like in Vancouver? Is it pretty, like, gung-ho or, like, really enthusiastic yeah. with people? I, I think the consensus is that it's the second best in Canada. Okay. Montreal is obviously yes. unbelievable. I hear fantastic. about Montreal all the time. I've never seen a yeah. show in Montreal, but I hear that all the time. You've got to go. You, you guys go. are so close. Okay. All right. Yeah, I, I, I'll put it on the list. I, actually, I've been... I've been to Montreal separately, not not during any one of the fests or anything, but I love that city too. Yes, it's beautiful. Yeah, I I think Vancouver has an extremely strong scene. Phil, why don't you jump in here? The thing that makes Vancouver interesting, I mean, I was born and raised in Calgary, Alberta. So it's a lot smaller of a population center than Calgary, especially when I was growing up there. And the scene there was a lot more, I guess, there was a lot more cross-pollination in between it. So coming to Vancouver, the main thing that shocked me was you could go to, say, I don't know, like a thrash metal show or something, and you would see a packed venue where you didn't recognize a single face from, say, the Black and Death Metal show that you went to the weekend before. Like, the scope of it is huge. And just... Yeah the ability for you to just go and see groups of people that don't even necessarily know each other, have any cross pollination whatsoever as gung ho within their respective genres. It just, the only thing I can really say to an outsider is just there's something for everybody. You're almost guaranteed to come here and find something that will not only be engaging, but it definitely will wet your whistle depending on what your taste is. Yeah. And I think a testament to what you're saying is, how many people yourself included have moved to vancouver simply because it's got a i don't know i know vancouverites seem to hate it but i think it's got a bit more of a joie de vivre if you're coming from somewhere else i mean part of being a vancouverite is hating vancouver that's just you're not from <laughs> vancouver if you don't hate it's it. not part of it it's the whole thing any vancouverite yeah. will tell you that this is the most soulless oppressive racist unfair boring bad city in the world but it's not the truth and then they're going to go tobogganing on the local mountain and then go yeah, to the beach exactly. and have a beer after they're, in the middle of fucking They're going to tell April. you that when they're going <laughs> from in between the world's best sushi for like $4 to a new craft brewery and then go skiing. And then they're going to tell you how bad the city is. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck's sake. Cool. Uh, I, I hate to I always say cool. Um <laughs> <laughs> Good, very self-critical. 
I like I know, it. You're very self-critical on the show. Uh, uh, Come out you. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think we're kind of at time unless, you know, unless we've got any other stories. I think we're, we're good. We, 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 you know, I learned a lot of shit. I, I thought, you know, uh, love the new, the new EP. I, I thought it was awesome and I was super stoked, stoked to talk to you guys. Thank so you. Uh, I really Thanks, appreciate man. you guys coming yeah, it's on. it's really good. The EP is really awesome. Great. Yeah, you know, we're, uh, we're just embracing this this break wholeheartedly and um not rushing through it learning to to take our time with it not feeling uh threatened by it and and next year starting with the uh the little tour with Niall here in Canada and we'll start writing a new record when the lockdown is over we've already got the lyrics penned um we did the lyrics for our last record actually it's right oh I thought it was right beside me we did the lyrics for our last record in a hardcover book so we've already got a the book sorted uh, again for the next record. We'll begin that one. We'll get that one done. We'll do the tour and, and we'll be right back. But it's, it's nice to take a break. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Um, and I, I guess that's a wrap. I guess we're good. Um, so again, really appreciate you, you coming on. Uh, let me know when you're promoting new stuff. Well, you know, next year, whatever, we'll have you back. And, uh, you know, send me all those links and I'll, I'll get it all posted on the, on the, in the description. Thank you. That was fun. Cool. Yeah, yeah, that was great. Thanks, Chris, Eric, for having us. Yeah. Thanks everybody. Later. Take care. Bye. Take care.